Since there are 210 skills in Diablo 2, we did a poll to see which class would get to go first, and needless to say, it was a close race, with Paladins winning by a few percent. So today, we're going to start it off easy with the healer's trifecta of prayer, cleansing, and meditation, and their useful interactions, just so that we have the groundwork for the more complex skills in the coming segments. The foundation of this set is the skill Prayer, which is sadly the only aura of the three you'll likely never see coming off of a player after normal, if even then. Though thankfully, the Act 2 Mercenary is able to use it without any of the mana draining side effects, so he's able to exploit a certain synergy perk we'll take advantage of later. Now, Prayer itself is a straightforward skill, where it consumes mana every two seconds to provide a bit of healing to every ally in its radius. The rate of healing is relatively low, though if you have a lot of allies, it can add up a little bit. But even at higher levels, it doesn't grow that much. This is in spite of it gaining an accelerated healing rate at level 17 and 29, at 2 or 3 per level, depending on which one of those you're at. It's sadly not enough to make the steadily increasing mana cost worth it, even though the mana only increased at 3 sixteenths of a point per level. Thankfully, when a mercenary uses it though, you don't have to worry about these mana costs, since he'll just trigger the healing consistently without fail, and he doesn't have a mana pool to drain. This leads us into a slightly better tool, though one you'll want to use carefully, and that is cleansing. One of only two poison and curse clearing skills in the game, though since shrines are treated identical to curses, it will reduce the duration of those as well. So do take care not to purge your friend of their experience shrine on runs, for example. And unlike Fade's effect, cleansing will trigger its effect every two seconds, meaning it will act on curses, poison, and even shrines, whether this was engaged before or after those effects hit. Now the really nice thing about cleansing, in addition to the debuff removal, is that it carries along with it any prayer levels you have for healing, but without any of the mana cost. So if you had 10 life healed by prayer every 2 seconds, then upgraded to cleansing, you'd still get that 10 life every 2 seconds while using this skill, but without the mana cost. And since they're separate auras, you can run this while your mercenary runs prayer to essentially double dip on healing. The last of the three skills is the one most people are familiar with due to the prevalence of the rune word Insight that provides its effect on pole arms and as of 2.4, bows. Like cleansing, meditation will pull the effects of the prayer aura onto it, which has led to a common practice of using Insight pole arms on prayer mercenaries for double the passive healing due to the auras not combating each other and the mercenary skill being counted towards the synergy. Though admittedly, even then it's relatively slow, but it is enough to regularly top you off outside of battle. As far as meditation itself, it's actually a fairly simple skill, just providing boosted mana regeneration rate for allies. Nothing more and nothing less outside of its synergies. It is one of the more sought after auras in the game due to this, though it is also very common due to just how cheap Insight is. Now you may have caught that these auras will let you stack multiple prayer effects when done properly. Just know that only the highest level auras will be the ones that cause the healing. So for example, if you have three paladins running meditation, you'll only get the effect from the highest level meditation. So be sure to keep people on different base auras for that kind of effect, and don't sit there trying to stack your meditation on top of an act to insight prayer mercenaries meditation. So, do you use these auras for any builds? How so and why? Mention them down below, and remember, these are the simple skills to serve as warm-ups for the spicier dishes down the road, and even some skills where we'll need to compare them head-to-head -head and determine a winner. So remember to have fun, and as always, keep it chill. This has been Alzrath. Bye. To continue the Paladin defensive auras, today we're going to look at mounting a resistance to the forces of L, or at least some of their elemental damage, since four elemental resistance auras are often overlooked tools with handy traits that new and even some experienced players may be unaware of. Starting out, we have the three individual resistance auras, resist fire, resist cold, and resist lightning, which, as you can guess, their active ability is providing you and your party resistances to their given elements. And even at level 1, it's a fairly significant amount at 52%, climbing to 131% at level 20, though you'll definitely feel diminishing returns as it goes higher, since the individual resist skills cap out at 150%. The other reason people use these skills, and generally the more popular reason, is their synergy with the holy auras of their given type. Then sometimes if people enjoy more esoteric builds, their synergy with the skill Vengeance. This is doubly true for what are known as Tesladins, Oradins, and Dragon Paladins, who use the skills to bump auras from equipment rather than ones they've invested hard points into, since this will allow them much more freedom with their skill point distribution, though we'll get a bit more into that in a future episode. This is because these auras actually have something else 
else included in their arsenal, and that is that they can also improve maximum resist, with different conditions determining just how much they do that. When not actively being used, they increase just the paladin's maximum resist by the skill level divided by two. So if you have 20 hard points in resist fire, but aren't actively using it, you'll end up with a cap of 85% fire resist instead of 75%. Now, if the aura is active, the paladin can actually share this boost to maximum resist, but at an even higher rate of 1% per hard point. So that 20 hard points in fire resist, while active, will actually make it so that you and your entire party can get up to 95% in your fire resists, greatly reducing the damage of fire attacks. Now, it's important that we remember that this is based on hard points, so plus skills will not boost the amount of maximum resist that they're limited to. And even if they could, you still would not be able to pass 95% as a player or a mercenary, though such a resist cap does not apply to summon minions. So don't be surprised if you can make certain minions fire immune if you pull this skill out, but you're not going to be doing that to yourself or your mercenaries. Now, you may have noticed at the beginning, I mentioned four skills, and so far we've only covered the first three. This is because there is one more, and it's the one you're more likely to see being used in the wild, and that's Salvation, which is basically the three individual auras combined, but without the maximum resist boost. As far as its percents, it actually starts higher than the individual resist boost skills, but it hits diminishing returns much faster, and caps a little lower at 120%. This usually results in most people treating it as a one-point wonder and letting plus skills do the rest. This is especially handy since, like the other three skills, it does not require any prerequisites and will provide a much smaller boost to all the elemental auras in Vengeance 2 through synergies. Now, one factor a lot of new players miss on this is just what it actually provides resistances to, since it's not a resist all boost, because it only provides a boost to fire, lightning, and cold damage. So you need to use your gear to handle that unfortunate poison damage that is going to creep in on you. Overall, I only rarely use these skills directly, though with the addition of equipment like the rune word flickering flame, I do hope we'll maybe, just maybe, see a few more of the resistance auras crop up on equipment to fit these themes in the coming patches. Though it is never a bad idea to consider how you'd use the passive bonuses on the individual resistance auras in a build, or even just getting one safety point in salvation should you find yourself against some particularly nasty elemental enemies. So do you prioritize resist, or would you rather focus on raw damage? Mention why down below, and stay tuned to the skill guide playlist if you want to learn more about the entire 210 skill library of Diablo 2. And as always, a special thanks to the channel members, patrons, and viewers like you for making videos like this possible. The main thing these last three auras from the Paladin Defensive Tree have in common is that a lot of players misunderstand just how useful each of them are, with Defiance being a handy tanking buff, Vigor being one of the best movement skills in the game, and Redemption being a full-blown pocket rejuvenation potion. These are also, interestingly enough, three auras that have the distinguishing characteristic of being used more often from equipment than from the skill slot itself. Starting with the most basic, we have Defiance, available both from an Act 2 mercenary as well as the Exile Rune Word. Defiance provides a general percent buff to defense, much like Might provides for damage. One of the most common myths about this skill is that it has a passive bump to character defense, but unfortunately this is not true. The reality is it has a synergy linking it back to Holy Shield, which boosts the defense gain of Holy Shield itself. And since Holy Shield is considered a must-have for Paladins, you can see how this myth was born. Now, in terms of how useful Defiance is, this really depends on how much defense you have from gear, and where you have your percent defense boost contributing to it. If you have low defense, or most of your defense comes from those off-armor percent sources, such as something like a Fortitude Weapon, then you'll see a far smaller gain from this since it's stacked with off-armor percents, and if there isn't a large base to work with, then it won't give a large bonus. There is also a big glaring factor of whether you're running or walking, since running will actually make Defiance entirely useless. On the subject of running though, we have another aura, Vigor, a handy aura that boosts the movement speed of all characters affected by it, and most often found coming off of either a paladin trying to zip through an area quickly if they don't have charge, or off of someone using a rogue mercenary with a harmony bow. Now, Run Walk can get complicated and have a whole guide of its own, but to keep it simple, Run Walk from equipment has diminishing returns, while Run Walk from skill
skills do not. So you'll notice a bigger increase from 30% Vigor than you will from 30% Boots. Though with a hard cap of 50%, Vigor will only contribute so much, and with the skill itself giving less for each level, it's usually best to treat it as a one-point wonder, and let plus skills do the rest, since even at level 4, you're halfway to its maximum potential. The other useful but less recognized aspect of Vigor is the stamina fixes it has, with a boost to maximum stamina and stamina recovery. These can be handy in some circumstances, such as against stamina burn enemies while you're trying to zip through the woods of Act 3, but for the most part this won't be a major concern as you get later in the game and have plenty of stamina to begin with. That is, unless you're using the skill to overcome heavy or medium armor stamina drains, which even then isn't really that heavy of a burden. The last aura, and probably my favorite skill of the entire defensive aura tree, is also sadly one of the most often overlooked. It's Redemption an aura that I commonly talk about as pocket rejuvenation potions, but also pulls double duty as a corpse removal tool for everything from Neolithac to just shutting down annoying mummies and shamans who love reviving their little friends, and even as a tool against Pindleskin and his friends. The way this aura works is that every two seconds it scans the area around the paladin for corpses, and it has a percent chance of consuming those corpses in exchange for a fixed amount of life and mana, from 25 per corpse consumed at level 1 up to hundreds as it scales up fairly quickly at 5 points per level, though I find 1 point with plus skills of course to usually be far more than enough due to how many corpses Diablo 2 likes to throw at us, and even at level 5 you have more than a 50% chance of eating a given corpse. In addition to quickly topping you off with health and mana, this also, as mentioned earlier, prevents those corpses from being used for anything else, whether that's corpse explosions, revivals, summoning skeletons, or even less common stuff like vine consumption on a druid. So you may not want to use it around your necro friends while they're building their armies, but it is exceptionally useful for solo runs and is one of a number of reasons why I love using Phoenix Shields on so many characters when it fits in the build. So that wraps up the defensive auras. If you miss the aura you're looking for, you can find links to some of them on screen now and the playlist that shows all the finished skill guides so far. If your favorite one is missing, stick around and it will be coming soon. And as always, a special thanks to the channel members and patrons who keep the channel running and who should be keeping an eye out for another poll fairly soon. Today, we're looking at easily one of the most popular Paladin skills in Diablo 2, and one that deserves a video of its own. That skill being Blessed Hammer, the core skill of the Hammerdin. Now, why this deserves a video of its own is because of two reasons. One being the actual depth of how damage works with the skill, its synergies and concentration, and two for dissecting the pros and cons of the skill compared to its major competitor as of 2.4, Fist of the Heavens. Now, starting with that second one, you have to realize that neither is 100% superior to the other. For example, Fist of the Heavens is absolute garbage at the cow level, while the Hammered In will do just fine. While on the flip side, Fist of the Heavens will easily outperform the Hammered in, in most undead or demon dense areas, despite hammers doing more damage. And they both will struggle in areas such as Maggot Lair, where tight corridors and beast enemies will keep both relatively neutralized. So simply put, it's best to choose which one you want to use based on where you would like to farm, as well as what you want your hybrid solution to be for dealing with those side situations. Though in terms of progression, I generally find the Hammered In to be relegated to second best, as of 2.4 at least, but still just as strong as he was in previous patches. If you'd like to hear more about the details as to why I think Fist of the Heavens beats it out for progression, stay tuned since the video covering it and Holy Bolt will be coming very soon. Though, since you came here for hammers, it's time we take a deeper dive on its mechanics, since there is often some confusion there, especially since it's one of the most altered skills in Diablo 2's history. Though, at its core, Blessed Hammer is an attack that spawns magical hammers that rotate out in a spiral pattern and deal magic damage. The easiest way to guarantee a hit with this skill is to Telestomp if you have access to Teleport, which is the act of teleporting directly on an enemy and starting to cast your hammers. This is due to hammers hitting everything immediately next to the Paladin. Now, if you don't have teleport, there are two other approaches, either casting hammer fields by moving to a spot, casting a few, and then moving to the next spot, resulting in enemies walking through the area of effect of existing hammers, or by positioning a more stationary target to the immediate top left of your paladin, which is the most reliable location to hit enemies due to how hammers initially spiral out. Now that we know how to hit them, it's time to move into determining how much damage they do. This is important for determining how you spend your points, since the damage for hammers is equal to base damage, times the synergy modifier, times concentration bonus, times the special modifiers against undead and demons. 
Yes, they are multiplied, not added. Though it is important to remember concentration only works at half efficiency for Blessed Hammer compared to normal attacks. Now, first and foremost, due to how base damage works, maxing the hammers themselves should be the highest priority, since the higher the base damage, the more impact each multiplier has. So you should generally get one point in a synergy, usually blessed aim, one point in concentration, and then focus in on maximizing blessed hammer first. And of course, get yourself some mana recovery, since those hammers will get expensive fast. Now the big question after that starts to become, well, should I invest in concentration or synergies next? And the answer is unfortunately complicated. Simply put, how you distribute points after hammer itself depends on your plus skills to concentration specifically. This is because of the multiplication we mentioned earlier and how concentration benefits from plus skills while the synergies do not. So the easiest to track method is to make sure you have at least 10 more levels in synergies than you have in concentration and then alternate between synergy and concentration until maxed. For example, if you have level 5 concentration with your equipment, you should have 15 points in synergies before you start alternating. If you have level 9 concentration with your equipment, you should have 19 points into synergies before you start alternating. This is not an absolutely perfect method, but it saves you the trouble of having to calculate it out with every level, and since most Hammerdens go for maximizing all of the above, it doesn't matter once you reach that certain level where you have all the points you need. Now, which synergy you should boost first is up to you, but generally, I prefer Vigor, since it provides more utility than Blessed Aim for a build, especially since the most common skill to pair with the Hammerden is Holy Shield and Smite, neither of which benefit from Blessed Aim. The last important thing to remember is that Blessed Hammer is pure magic damage, and it no longer pierces magic resistances like it did in previous patches, so you will need an alternate method of dealing with magic immunes like Wailing Beasts and some form of mummies, though which method you choose is up to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to post them below, as well as if you have a favorite skill set you like to pair with the common 80-point Blessed Hammer build. And as always, a special thanks to the patrons and channel members for their support of the channel. Next in the Diablo 2 skill guide portion of the game manual series, we have probably the most influential ability in the Paladin's arsenal, combined with one of the most used, but least talked about utility skills in the game that, funnily enough, lends a decent amount of punch to the former. The skills in question are Smite and Holy Shield, the 1-2 combo that are core picks for uber slayers and an amazing sidearm for general progression, especially against bosses. Starting with the simpler of the two, we have Holy Shield, a skill you see every paladin use outside of the rarity that is two-handed paladins. This skill is a great defensive skill and even the source of a myth thanks to its common use and its synergy with Defiance. On more than one occasion, the comment about Defiance providing a passive defense boost has come up when the reality is this defense boost is strictly from Holy Shield synergy and only applies while Holy Shield is active, which should tell you just how integral this skill is. Now, besides boosting the total defense of your character, not just the shield, it actually provides a lot of other key bonuses, ranging from increased block chance, which is stacked on top of other increased block chance mods, and is essential to keeping your dexterity requirements for max blocking in check, since the 75-25 block cap is only applied after all the calculations are done, with 75 being the standing walking cap and 25 being the running cap. This is stacked on top of it, also providing drastically improved block speed, dropping you to a 2 frame block with no other modifiers involved, which is faster than most characters can get even with hundreds of percents of faster block rate. The last boost, and the reason this is paired with Smite, is that it increases the base damage of shields for use with, well, Smite. It's not a massive amount, but it can still easily double the base damage of even Elite Shield before the percent boosts from elsewhere take effect, and can even be used to make an exceptional shield closer to competitive with even Elites. Now, to prevent any confusion about pre-buffing, Holy Shield functions at the level you originally cast it at, much like Enchant does for a Sorceress, regardless of what your character screen says. The only way to change the level of your Holy Shield cast is to cast a higher level version of it to override it, though since the only way to get plus skills specifically for Holy Shield on Scepters is through a bug that people have claimed no longer exists in Resurrected and I have yet to encounter it again myself, you'd be hard pressed to get much better Holy Shields than your standard skiller gear setup for casters. Now, with Holy Shield done, the real star of this episode is going to be the skill everyone loves to talk about, Smite, or more commonly the skill everyone from budget uber slayers to fully tweaked uber farmers use. 
Now, this skill is a bit of an oddball, with a lot of exceptions, loopholes, and odd behavior, but hopefully I can keep it from being too weird to understand. So let's start with the easy stuff first. The range and speed of your smiting is actually based on your choice of weapon, so a phase blade will be relatively short range but fast, while a berserker axe will be slightly longer range but a little slower. And your choice of weapons should also consider the durability of the weapon since smite will use that up, though it will never break the weapon until you perform a non smite attack, and since smite always hits, cannot be blocked, and usually wants to swing fast, you definitely want something packing at least a reasonable amount of durability. Now smite actually does have a few drawbacks whenever it comes to normal use. Probably the first one you'll notice is that it has knockback, which is one big reason it's generally used on bosses rather than your average enemy since bosses can't be knocked back, so no having to play the chase game as you knock something across the field. Though that knockback can be useful in interrupting more annoying enemy attack patterns, so it's not entirely useless and the stun effect Smite provides makes this interruption last quite a bit longer, which can be nice as well. The other big drawback is that Smite has a very limited set of modifiers it can take advantage of, the big one being the fact that it cannot leech, so you need to use skills such as Life Tap to restore life while using it, and you generally want to have some sort of mana regeneration effect to keep your mana topped off. Now, in terms of what modifiers Smite can bring with it, probably the most important one is Damage Plus, which you can only find on Grief, Stone Crusher, Astrion's Iron Ward, and the Redeemer. This damage is added to the base damage of the shield before the smite, stat, or aura percent boost to your damage due. So you'll notice a Grief Paladin dealing many times the base damage per hit compared to non-Grief Paladins. Now, don't confuse this with plus minimum or maximum damage effects, as those are not added. They are completely different modifiers. The other super important effects you'll be carrying on Smite are Crushing Blow and Open Wound, as these are essential to being a strong smiting paladin, as they will serve to chunk enemy life down much quicker than your base damage, as well as prevent enemies from healing thanks to the tick damage on bleed. In terms of the percent boost, the only percent boost you'll be getting on Smite are going to be 1. Your Strength Modifier, 2. Your Aura Modifiers, 3. Your Off Weapon Enhanced Damage Percent Effects, and 4. Your Smite Modifier itself. And you will not, will not, get enhanced damage to demons or undead, so laying of hands doesn't do that much, and you won't get the enhanced damage on your weapon proper, just like you'll not get any of form of elemental, magic, or poison damage for smite. You'll also never get critical strike with smite, as these do not carry on to the attack, so no doubling your damage on a lucky hit with a crit or deadly strike. That said, this is fine since the percent boost from smite and auras can get fairly high with enough plus skills, and the lack of elemental damage isn't too big of an issue since you still do get the status effect modifiers like freeze target, blind target, and slow, in addition to the crushing blow and bleed we mentioned earlier. So in general, Smite is a complicated beast, but it gets enough modifiers to be useful, and when combined with the right status effect oriented gear, can be just as useful as other attack types, if not more so thanks to the auto hit, especially since it can get to a fairly fast 6 frames, or a little over 4 attacks per second. And as usual, your character screen will not give you the full story of this, so take the numbers you see there with a grain of salt. So, was this too much information for one video? Do you like using Smite on builds other than Uber Farmers? Mention it down below. And as always, any and all support is extremely appreciated so I can continue bringing you gaming content and guides. Today, we're going to hit up two of the most misunderstood paladin skills in Diablo 2, the level manipulating enemy controlling skill known as Conversion, which I will probably accidentally call Conviction at least once, and the mechanically mangled elemental brick on a stick that is Vengeance. Both these skills have interesting utility, but due to how Diablo is designed and how they specifically work, they see far less use since neither can really match the speed or utility of more straightforward skills, despite having rather fun mechanics. Starting with the more popular of the two, we have Vengeance, essentially the cornerstone skill of a build known as the Avenger. The skill basically adds fire, lightning, and cold damage to all of your attacks, but instead of adding a flat value, it's based on a percent of, well, some of your damage, but not all of it. And because of that, this is going to be convoluted, but basically it takes the damage you see on your weapon in your inventory, which already includes the calculations for its built-in modifiers, and then adds to that any plus minimum and maximum flat damage from off-weapon sources as well, such as charms, jewels, boots, etc. And then it multiplies the result by the listed percents. 
This means that any aura boosts, any percent damage on armor, gloves, etc., and not even the ever desirable damage plus ability from stuff like grief will end up impacting the damage of vengeance itself. This results in Vengeance having some weird weapon loadouts and a bit more planning around your gear proper if you want to really boost that elemental damage. Now even with the limited pool of ways to boost the number it's based off of, there are plenty of ways to boost the skill damage itself, with skill levels adding generally the most damage, at 6% per level per element for a total of 18% if you're just boosting Vengeance itself, individual resist auras adding 10% per level for just the single element they represent, and salvation aura adding the least amount per level with 2% per element, for a total of about 6%. And it's also worth noting, the chill duration from the skill is based solely on the level of vengeance itself, and of course, any cold duration you have from gear. Now, normally the explanation would stop there with combat skills, but due to the nature of vengeance, we need to talk about skill boost effects as well. Starting off with the most asked question, does Mage Fist work with it, which is plus fire skills? And the answer is unfortunately no. For some unknown reason, Vengeance is not considered a fire skill. That said, percent sources such as Rainbow Facets and, for the sake of Vengeance, Sorceresses, Fire and Lightning Masteries do impact the damage of the skill, and ultimately in a nice way. This is because these percent damage sources are applied after the calculation for the damage is already done. So if you, for example, have a 200 damage weapon with a flat 200% Vengeance because it's low level or something for everything, and let's say 20% from Lightning Rainbow Facets you would deal a total of 1280 elemental damage on top of your normal attack damage. This is because you would be doing 400 fire, 400 cold, and then 480 lightning damage thanks to the rainbow facets. Obviously, these numbers can get much higher since you not only have the plus skills and synergies boosting them, meaning it's not uncommon for an Avenger to hit around 500-600% to 600 in a couple elements, with around 300% in the third before the elemental booster from items. Now something I normally wouldn't do in these game manual videos is a pinch of strategy discussion. I generally prefer focusing on fire and lightning on my Avengers since they are the easiest elements to get piercing and boosting for, for use alongside conviction at least. They are the best resist to push over max as well thanks to the passive effects we talked about whenever we, we did the resist aura video. And lastly, your chill duration is only affected by the level of vengeance, nothing else. Not to mention that cold is also the hardest resist to break in the game. Now, as far as our other misunderstood skill, we have conversion. This one is misunderstood because frankly, it's almost never used outside of some very specific cases. And you really need to know how it works to keep yourself from getting killed by your own auras. Now the skill's base function is to turn your enemy to your side when you basically just swing at them since the skill does not actually need to hit to trigger. Though this conversion only lasts for 16 seconds. And with 2.4, the chance of this happening, the conversion that is, had its cap increased from the old 50% all the way up to the new 90%, meaning you can actually kind of build around almost reliably converting whatever you hit. Now, as expected, for the most part, you can only convert normal or minion monsters. And though a few of the base monster types Types are naturally immune to it, they're not super common. And probably the last fairly well-known aspect of this skill, and usually the reason a lot of people don't use it, is that when converted, the monsters gain your active support auras, which can result in them using those auras against you for a couple seconds at least, after the conversion expires. Sometimes meaning extra fun, high-level fanaticism mobs punching you in the face. Now, the less known aspects of this skill are how it impacts your experience gain, as well as how it can dynamically change a monster's stats. As far as the experience gains go, basically you'll get experience for anything the converted monsters kill, but you will not get experience if the converted monster is killed by enemies. So it can slow down your leveling a tiny amount, but in the long run it won't really matter too much. Though whenever it comes to the stats of the monsters, it's kind of an odd thing since it will look at your level and compare it to the level of the monster naturally, and it will set the monster's level and their stats to match the lower of the two while they're under your control at least. So if you're a low level character converting high level monsters, you may be trying to fight that level 85 frenzy tar pack with a level 72 converted frenzy tar itself. 
I still have yet to understand why they added this extra layer, except maybe there's some weird fringe PvP concern or wanting to keep conversion from being the go-to for low-level challenges, but it's there and is one reason why your converted beasties may be fighting an uphill battle. Now there's also some oddities that vary sadly depending on what version of Diablo 2 you play, though pretty much if you're lower level than the converted enemy, you can expect them to lose life when converted from friend back to enemy, though how this behaves is pretty significantly different between Resurrected and Lord of Destruction, so yeah, it does help out, but it helps out more in the older version. So do you have any builds you enjoy with either of these skills, or do you stick with the standard fare for the Paladin? Mention it down below, and a special thanks to those who actively support the channel, and if you want to see more detailed dives into skills, check out the playlist on the screen right now. As we push through the Paladin combat skills, we of course need to look at the current popular kit in patch 2.4, Fist of the Heavens, and of course, the more important little brother, Holy bolt that sadly a lot of people ignore despite the fact that it is the true workhorse of builds based on this skill in 2.4. Now we're actually going to start with that little workhorse since it is the cornerstone of almost every aspect of the skill duo. This is because Holy Bolt as an attack spell has a few special properties outside of the obvious healing and damage that it does, especially now that 2.4 allows it to affect not only undead but now demons as well, which means it is effective against about two thirds of the enemies in the game and every single act boss. And with the fact that it pierces, even one Holy Bolt can be pretty effective at crowd control too, much like the Necromancer skill Bone Spear. There is even a bit of a kicker to that, that it even does more damage per point invested than Spear, since with 40 points invested in Holy Bolt and Fist of the Heavens, and of course your standard plus skills, it can easily compete with a similarly kitted Necro Bone Spear kind of build with around 100 points invested in the skills and synergies. Now there is an argument that this comes with the drawback of only being able to damage demons and undead, and this is definitely a drawback that will limit your capabilities in areas like cows, or even some of the key areas for progress through three of the five acts. Though this comes with obvious skill point perks, since you can easily spec into something to handle these, but it also comes with another perk that most people don't recognize, magic resistance piercing. Basically, Holy Bolts, both the manually cast ones as well as the ones from Fist of the Heavens, treat targets as if they have zero magic resistance. This makes the skill significantly stronger against bosses than you would first realize, since with the exception of Andariel and Bale, the other three bosses have fairly significant magic resistance, and so do a handful of enemies you might not otherwise expect. And it is worth noting, this piercing even pierces immunities as well, such as the ever-loved Greater Mummies found in Act 2 as well as in the Bale Waves. Now beyond this, we could talk about Holy Bolt and how it can heal your mercenary, which is nice for a caster since you can keep him topped off by lining yourself up just right with him and the enemy so you can hit both him and the enemy, and how you can invest in prayer to boost this healing, but generally those points will be better spent elsewhere, but it is still something you can look at if your secondary skill choice is something equally low in point requirements like a Zealot or a Smiter, and it is worth noting that the healing aspect of Holy Bolt only comes with the manually cast ones, not the physical the Heavens ones, which only shoots damaging bolts. Now you would think Fist of the Heavens itself would get equally pumped up by these effects, and if you're thinking of the Holy Bolts it shoots out at enemies on the screen, you would be correct. Though, while Fist of the Heavens does shoot out a bolt, even for the enemy being targeted, the target has to move towards you to be hit by it, otherwise they're just getting pinged with the lightning, which is a bit less impressive. Now this is because the lightning in Fist of the Heavens is a trap a lot of people fall for by dumping heavily into Conviction and Holy Shock to kind of support it, which can work for PvP but is painfully slow as a tool for player versus monster, since the main work Fist of the Heavens will do is in the form of crowd control and launching a large number of lower damage bolts for each cast. The lightning itself only really being effective for beasts or players, otherwise actually casting Holy Bolt will generally be faster for any demon or undead, even bombs outside of very specific gear loadouts unless you have a very large clump of enemies. Now that said, there are niche situations where you might want to do this, the overinvestment into Fist of the Heavens, such as team play with a sorceress, since between you and the sorceress you will generally destroy any threat possible, especially with your conviction oriented build based on lightning, or with a melee tank character to help you out to drop enemy defense to pitiful levels, pretty much guaranteeing they can hit and well, a leech if it's something that's not undead. Though in both of these cases, you can usually pick out better skill combinations for them since you're basically relegating yourself to support for them 
with your own ability to clear places like Chaos and Worldstone being okay, but against monsters, you're just kind of like a cheerleader. But overall, like I said at the beginning, the important skill for the build will be your Holy Bolt skill due to how cheap it is, how it can be improved with faster cast, unlike Fist of the Heavens, which can't because it has cooldowns, and the fact that it can get up to a significantly higher per shot damage than Fist of the Heavens even, all while leaving you plenty of points to dive into a second build to handle beasts on the same character. So do you enjoy the new Fist of the Heavens, or should I say Holy Bolt build? Do you prefer to stick with the classic Blessed Hammer that has to contend with magic resistances and immunities, or are you more of a melee paladin player? Mention it down below, and special thanks to all the patrons, channel members, and supporters that make these videos possible, and if you want to know about the rest of the paladin skills, check out the playlist on screen now as we continue to work our way through the depths of the skill trees and weird mechanics. Rounding out the last of the Paladin combat tree, we have the three workhorse skills. One, a starter tool that saves on mana cost. Two, an underestimated movement skill with some offensive abilities. And three, a staple of countless melee Paladin builds. Those of you familiar with the Paladin tree probably know these as Sacrifice, Charge, and Zeal each of which has been used in its own unique build as well. Starting with the one you can use from the very beginning of the game, we have Sacrifice, a skill that was improved to a point where I even made a build guide for it specifically, but it is still weird in its own ways in 2.4. The way it was improved is that the percent damage to self now decreases as you invest more in the ability, which means you'll usually end up being punished less for more potential damage, at least as you level it and its synergies, redemption, and fanaticism, of course. Though you do want to take into account the mechanics of the skill before you dive into it full bore. First up, and probably the most important, is how the damage return is handled. Simply put, the amount of damage you take is strictly based on the damage you do. For example, whacking a physical immune with sacrifice will end up in you taking zero damage since you dealt zero damage. Whereas if you do 5,000 damage to a target and have a high level 1% sacrifice, you'll take 50 damage, which isn't that bad. Now it is also important to note that Sacrifice does not utilize any form of critical or deadly strike and will not utilize damage boosters such as damage to demons or undead, so you're actually less likely to surprise yourself by doing an extraordinary amount of damage because of it. Now, the other aspect of this is the actual damage coming from it, which unfortunately cannot be mitigated since it bypasses damage reduction effects for better or worse. So, for example, your vampire's gaze will not reduce the damage you take, but if you're amp damaged, you still won't take any extra damage from it either. Though, of course, hitting an amp damage target will increase the damage you do and thus the damage you take, but that's a whole different matter. The last aspect is in regards to sacrifice and life leech. Like many recovery effects, it follows the loss first, heal second principle, so you'll always take the damage from Sacrifice before you heal from things such as Life Leech or Life Tap, so you generally want to swap off if you find yourself in a panic zone of low life or fighting things you can't leech from, so you don't make it worse. But overall, for a mana-free damage boost, it is pretty solid, especially since it can pretty easily get into the 900% damage or even higher range with synergies. Now, moving down the list, we have Charge, probably one of the most underutilized but still exceptionally good movement skills in the game, mostly thanks to the popularity of Caster Paladins and Enigma, though. That said, until you get expensive items, this can still be a great overall skill and can even free up the armor slot for resist or damage reduction later on. Now, the reason Charge is so good is that it greatly increases your movement speed value, though it is worth noting that it's based on the base speed values that are only affected by skills, not by gear. So the faster run-walk boots won't speed it up, but Vigor will. Though this also means you can be heavily slowed down by skills like Decrepify and Holy Freeze, though thankfully in Resurrected, a lot of the buggy behavior with it has been counteracted, so you don't have to live in constant fear of the dreaded reverse charge. That said, you do need Need to remember while charging your block is treated like running block so it is capped at 25 percent and you'll likely get punched while darting through packs of enemies now in terms of how it functions in proper use you can intentionally target thin air strictly to use it as a movement skill like leap attack but without the ability to evade terrain obstacles if you however want to use it as an actual attack the skill does decent damage especially with its synergies of might and vigor it also does a knockback effect which in this case works to its advantage since it can often allow sequential charges though it is worth noting that charge is not affected by attack speed so for chargers you generally want bigger slower weapons to maximize damage output. Now, if you cannot knock an enemy back, such as an act boss, charge will not trigger if you are in melee range with an opponent, so you'll just be burning mana while doing extra basic normal attacks, without any of the charge attack rating or damage perks. 
Now, one thing to remember, and it's far more common in Legacy, is that if you get snagged by the movement bug with charge, a weapon swap can be used to sometimes fix it. Though it is uncommon, it can be annoying to get stuck in place. Though I have yet to encounter it again since the release of 2.4, so I think they might have done some fixing on it in the back end. Last but not least is Zeal, pretty much the quintessential cornerstone skill of the majority of melee paladin builds. This is likely due to how the skill is both faster attacking and far simpler than the previous skills in this video, with the big unique aspect of the skill being that the series of attacks from Zeal are unable to be interrupted by blocking, casting, knockback, stun, etc. So you're able to hit quick, not worry about getting locked, and you're able to handle multiple enemies relatively easily. In terms of the actual attack pattern, Zeal follows the long recovery method of multi-attacks rather than the long wind-up. This means that the skill uses its fastest attacks right off the bat, with only the final attack taking the full attack animation. Though generally by the time you're doing 5 attacks with Zeal, this won't be something you really need to consider in any real detail. As far as synergies, the sacrifice synergy is usually better than even putting more points into the skill itself, for me at least, unless you're desperate for more attack rating, or you have not reached that 5 attack limit yet, which you reach really early on, though generally most builds that use it don't even worry too much about the synergy since they're often using other skills to supplement the attacks with elemental damage or chance to cast effects, though you can lean into physical with weapons like grief sometimes. And with that, we've rounded up the Paladin combat skills. Next up, the Offensive Auras, which contain easily some of the strongest and most desirable skills in the game, so stay tuned for that. So do you have a favorite Paladin skill? Mention it down below, and I might use it for the cornerstone of a build video in the new format we have coming up. And as always, a special thanks to the patrons, channel members, and subscribers that help with the cost of running the channel, and if you want to help out, you can find links to them in the description down below. The offensive aura tree can be divided pretty much into three categories, offensive boosters, area damage, and oddball utility. Today we're going to be covering that third category, which is comprised of two often misunderstood auras. Despite being some of the most talked about skills in the entire game, Conviction and Thorns are both skills that many players often forget or just don't know the full functionality of, which results in them leaving a lot of potential power on the cutting room floor. Starting with the less popular of the two, Thorns, we have the most well-known but sadly rarely used Damage Retaliation skill, which with 2.4 received an interesting buff in the form of now dealing flat damage in addition to percent damage. Now, the way Thorns works is that it only functions against enemies attacking within melee range, so it is a bit useless against ranged opponents, which are usually the bigger threat in Diablo 2, so you can see why it's a bit less popular. That said, it has utilities that are often ignored, especially if there are any allied summons in play against act bosses. This is because the percent damage retaliation is based off the amount of physical melee damage an enemy deals to an allied character. Which, while for players, this is nothing special, it's important to remember that act bosses deal double damage to mercenaries and quadruple damage to summons. So by taking advantage of this, as well as something like amplified damage, a pack of necro or druid summons, or even stuff like valkyries or shadows, can soak melee hits from each of the bosses and actually reflect significant damage, especially considering they will often have larger life pools or at least larger numbers to compensate at higher levels. Now, as far as the flat damage from Thorns, this is more just a nice to have these days, since the way it functions is based around just the enemies swinging in melee, so whether they hit or not, this gives Thorns the ability to at least return some damage. Though it is worth noting, it's not quite enough like damage in general to make a big difference in late Nightmare or Hell, so if you're using it then, you're usually using it as part of a summoner party, or specifically against bosses, and using a separate aura for other situations, which, surprising to some, will ideally be something like today's second aura, Conviction. Though before we hit that, the last little bit of housekeeping for Thorns is that it only deals physical damage, and it is affected by physical resists, for better or worse. So it is garbage against physical immunes, but great against amplified targets. The other thing to remember is Thorns has reduced efficiency against players and mercenaries to the order of dealing 1 eighth damage, so don't expect this to be some amazing PvP trick just to use against like spin to win barbarians. Now, as far as Conviction goes, most people know about its resist functions because it's used so bloody often by lightning sources, javazons, and trapsins through the Infinity Rune Word, though a lot of new or intermediate players will have at least one misunderstanding about this skill, either in understanding how it works for resists, or defense, or in terms of contested aura checks. 
Starting with its most popular use, minus resistances, it is one of only two ways to break elemental immunities in the game. The other one is the curse lower resist. Just like with salvation and boosting resist though, conviction only affects lightning, fire, and cold resists, and against immunities it works at one fifth the normal efficiency. So even with its maximum level, it can only reduce immune creature resists by 30% by itself since it tops out at 150. And this effect is applied at the same time as lower resists effect in regards to damage checks, so even if one skill would break the immunity, they are both penalized this way. This means that you often want to combine it with facet style effects, since they are applied after the break, meaning if you break an immunity with conviction, a rainbow facet will work at its full listed value, while lower resist will still only work at one fifth. Whereas if you don't break the immunity, the rainbow facet will have absolutely zero effect. Now why it's used so often for lightning is because lightning is the easiest element to break the immunity of, since most lightning immune monsters rarely pass 100% resists, while fire immunes often sit in the 110 to 130 range, and cold immunes are often 140% or even higher, with only a few exceptions in each case. So you can see why people like infinity for lightning builds, while the low level of conviction on infinity keeps it from being useful for the other two. Now, one area where people ignore conviction is in regards to defense, especially in the situation we mentioned earlier with summons. Because, let's be honest, summons very often have awful attack ratings, so conviction reducing enemies' defense by upwards of 80%, even at those low levels, will make a significant impact on their chance to hit, greatly improving their overall damage over time by reducing the complete misses. This can also be really useful if you or your allies are having trouble hitting in a team where you just happen to be undergeared or underleveled, since more hits means more leeching, means more triggers, and more damage for you as well. The last aspect of conviction is contested auras, something you pretty much only see talked about in regards to Uber Mephisto, but it also applies to random aura enchanted enemies in the wild that just happen to roll conviction. The way it works on the individuals with conviction is the highest aura win situation if if both auras are active before encountering each other, and if tied, there are some fun mechanics you can mess around with by forcing an enemy's conviction to lower their own resists and defense until they swap auras, which enemies like monsters don't, even if you change yours. But it's convoluted and rare to come across, so most people stick with just packing a level 25 conviction and going for max functionality and max override. Now as far as overrides and why we mention having them active before encountering, and it's important to reiterate that only matters if both auras were activated before interacting, if you switch to conviction after already being under it, the rules will change despite the character screen not really reflecting it. It basically becomes a first come first serve situation. If you want to override a conviction, even with a higher level one, you need to disengage, lose the enemy conviction, switch to yours, and then re-engage the enemy. It doesn't display right on your screen, but you will feel the difference as the older one will actually generally wipe out the newer one. So only ones applied at the same time will behave as you expect. Hopefully that was a clear enough explanation on Conviction, as it's a fairly convoluted situation whenever it comes to the contested auras, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them below. The only stupid question is the one you never ask. Well, that and a question several months back asking about how to find the Cold Plains waypoint, but we don't talk about that. And as always, a special thanks to the channel patrons, members, and Twitch subscribers for their continued support of the channel's ever-expanding content. Continuing the Paladin Offensive Tree, we dive into one of the more interesting corners, the four damage auras. This is mainly because their utility is almost entirely at the fringe of the Paladin builds, being either extremely strong starter builds like the Holy Fire Paladin, very specific use case builds like the Lawbringer or Sanctuary Paladins, or extremely expensive late game builds like the item based Oradin variants. The only real drawback of these builds is that they're very selfish compared to other auras, since most of the boosts only help the Paladin. Needless to say, to get their full potential late game, you need to know what you're doing. So in this video, we're going to mostly cover how the skills work as active abilities, but stay tuned because I'm also working on a second video for these and other auras, thanks to items like Dream, Dragon, Lawbringer, etc. having their own special mechanics and not wanting to turn this into a 30 minute video. Though before we dive in, I want to give special thanks to all the patrons, channel members, and Twitch subs whose continued support has helped make this entire series possible. That aside, let's jump on in. Starting out, let's start at the top with the cornerstone of one of the best builds for sweeping through normal, Holy Fire. 
At first glance, it may seem like a super simple skill, dealing fire damage in a radius every two seconds, and adding fire damage to your attack, and of course being bumped up by its usual elementally tied synergies. And for the most part, you would be correct. Though being fire, it does get a few interesting perks, ranging from simple stuff like benefiting from plus fire skills on items like Mage Fist or Hexfire, to more interesting perks such as how with exploding arrows, the fire damage applied to the weapons will also apply to the fiery explosions. Not to mention on melee attacks, if you use this with items like rainbow facets, the percent boost to fire damage is applied twice, once to the base boost and then again to the actual attack, though sadly this is a melee only effect. Moving down, we have what is generally considered the more party friendly damage aura, that is unless you're playing with a necromancer friend, and that is Holy Freeze, which as you can tell by the name does cold damage in a radius and adds cold to your attack, but it also has the effect of chilling your enemies, and I phrase it that way very intentionally. Basically, this is because the aura does not apply a cold effect, but rather specifically a slow effect tied to a hidden stat called chill effectiveness. This means that items that provide cannot be frozen, as well as even being just cold immune in general will do nothing against it, but rather it is only able to be negated by enemies with zero chill effectiveness, which is only available on certain monsters. Oh, and of course, it won't apply to act bosses because that would just be broken. Also, much like Holy Fire, plus percent skill damage stacks twice on melee attacks, and similarly the cold damage from Holy Freeze will travel with freezing arrow explosions, much like the Holy Fire did with exploding arrows. The last of the elemental damage auras is Holy Shock, which as you can guess applies much like Holy Fire and Holy Freeze. It deals its damage in a radius, it applies to weapons, and with the percent increased lightning damage it will get twice stacked bonuses on melee, though unlike the previous two, it doesn't really have any abilities it can travel along with as far as its explosions, so no, it does not get to make Lightning Fury even scarier. Though it is kind of funny that the highest level one of the elemental auras is by far the simplest in terms of effects, with its only unique feature being the usual high max damage, bare bones minimum damage of lightning, just kind of like throughout the game. Now you may be saying, that's just three auras, this guy right here said four damage auras, and you'd be right, there's one more, this one dealing magic damage with a bunch of its own rules, the most well known being the part that says it only affects undead, and that is Sanctuary, an exceptionally buggy skill and legacy that has slowly been getting repaired bit by bit in Resurrected. This odd aura deals magic damage to hostile undead in the radius, also knocking them back, only really being reduced by the magic resistances on the enemies themselves, which are few and far between. With patch 2.4, the magic magic damage added to the character attacks has supposedly been fixed, though it is only so important since the skill also has the ability to pierce undead physical resistance, though in its own special way. Basically, Sanctuary checks the enemy physical resistance at the moment of attack, and if it is greater than 0%, it reduces it to 0%. If it's less than 0%, it leaves it alone. So if, for example, the enemy is amp damaged and has negative overall physical resistances, Sanctuary's piercing will do nothing to it and leave it at that negative amount, where if an enemy is physical immune, it will strip that away entirely and reduce it to zero. Though interestingly, this only applies to the actual attack, not modifiers like, say, Crushing Blow, which will continue to have no effect on physical immunes. So, do you run any damage aura builds? Are yours actively used, or are they tied into items? And did you know that with the right item setups, you can get each of the radius effects up to apply multiple times over at high levels? Mention it down below, and of course, stay tuned for the video explaining that last question. To round out the Paladin skills, we finally arrive at the combat auras. Might, Blessed Aim, Concentration, and Fanaticism. While overall they are some of the more simple and straightforward auras in the game, there are a few quirks you will want to keep in mind while using these, especially with specific builds or allies involved. Starting with the most basic of the four, Might, we have a straightforward boost to damage, based on percent of course. It is most commonly used only at super low levels for builds like early Martyrs and Zealots, or later on as a mercenary or item based aura for boosting characters without conflicting with the more desirable and powerful auras. This is especially true since later auras not only provide more enhanced damage, but also special perks that plain old Might just can't do. Next down the tree we have Blessed Aim, the attack rating focused cousin of Might, and in most cases just as plain and simple, though at least it provides a bonus that is higher than its later counterparts. What gives Blessed Aim a little more in the way of useful layers though, is that there's actually two mechanics to be considered for it. The first and most obvious outside of its synergy with Blessed Hammer is that it provides a passive attack rating boost to the Paladin when not active, providing a 5% increased attack rating for every hard point invested. 
The other unique feature of it is more of a negative, sadly, and that is how Blessed Aim overrides the Amazon skill known as Penetrate. This is because of how they're coded, unfortunately, so if you are dealing with an ally that runs high Penetrate, or if you're an Amazon considering a Blessed Aim mercenary, realize that all the points invested in Penetrate will be a waste so long as this aura is running. After that, we make a return to a more simple skill yet again, with Concentration being essentially a souped-up version of Might, providing more damage, a relative relatively unimpactful modifier to make attacks uninterruptible sometimes, and probably its most well-known bonus, providing a boost specifically to Blessed Hammer while running. Now, this bonus is only half of the listed value, but it's still more than enough to make Blessed Hammer viable due to how it stacks with the synergies, since synergies are applied before any aura boosts occur. And last, but far from least, we have easily the most popular aura for characters that benefit from attack speed, Fanaticism. This is basically because it combines the attack speed boost with both the enhanced damage and attack rating, and while individually these values are lower than their competing auras, the fact that they are all combined into one with this speed makes it far more valuable as a one-stop solution to all three desires. Now, even though it is listed on the skill card itself, it is important to remember the person using fanaticism gets the larger damage bonus, while those around them get half as much. And since the rule of higher level aura wins does apply here, there can be situations where if two people are using fanaticism at slightly different levels, the slightly higher fanaticism can override the lower level fanaticism and actually reduce the benefits the lower level aura user gets from the skill. That's why you'll often see paladins swap into concentration or conviction when paired with another paladin of similar level with more plus skills, so at least the aura slot is not wasted. And with that, we round out the entire Paladin skill library, and you can look forward to a compilation for it in the near future for those looking to binge watch. And as always, a special thanks to the channel patrons, whose support is key to the continued survival of the channel.